Welcome back to another episode of From Prison to the Streets. I'm Eric. Let me apologize. Let me apologize. Let me apologize in advance if the audio or video quality is somewhat lacking. I just got a new camera, uh, my first DSLR, so I'm still figuring out how to get some of the manual settings to work. And so, yeah. In today's episode, we are going to be talking about my first day in prison, what that was like, and we're going to continue my story from where I left off. Last time I was talking about going to sentencing and being sentenced to 12.8 years in prison. So we're picking up from there. Be sure to like and subscribe. A big thank you to all my subscribers and all my viewers. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you. Now let's get into this. Now. A few things happened after I was sentenced, after I left the courtroom. Me and my co-defendants were sentenced on the same day. We all took the same plea agreement, and we all ended up with the same amount of time. As far as my co-defendants, I don't talk about them a lot on this channel. Um, it's more of a respect thing, and for one, and for two, um, I don't really get along with one of my co-defendants that much. I don't really think highly of them. So there's that. And I'm about to tell you why I don't think that highly of them. You're about to see how a situation played out and mm, yeah, yeah. So after I left the courtroom, one of my co-defendants, Jake, gets up in front of the courtroom and you know, when you're sentenced, you have a moment to speak your piece. You know, you can tell the court why you th think you should get less time or something like that. And he gets up and he starts telling the court, the judge, how I was a stone cold killer and a cold blooded psychopath. And he felt intimidated by me. And so he just went along with what was going on because he didn't feel like he could stop it without being hurt, which was a lie, uh, completely a lie. He was trying to dodge responsibility, try to put stuff off on someone else. And if that's the type of person you are, that's whatever, but don't expect me to respect it. I have always tried to own up for what I've done. I don't justify it. I don't minimize it. I realize that I've done some pretty bad things and there's nothing I can do to change that. What I do is I try to do my best here and now not to repeat the mistakes that I've made in the past. And I try to be a better person every day. So he's up there talking all this shit on me, trying to put it all off on me, addressing the courtroom. And when it was all over, I can't tell you exactly what, what he said about me because I had already left the courtroom. They had cuffed me up and they were taking me back to county jail. You don't go to prison immediately after you get sentenced. You usually go back to jail for a couple weeks while you wait for a bed to open up. So I wasn't there. I don't know exactly how it went down, but I'll tell you what did happen when he left that courtroom. What he said was, um, you know, bad enough that my mom felt the need to spit on the guy and she got tackled by the cops and he decided that he wanted to press charges on her for battery. So yeah, I don't know how you're going to act like a tough guy one minute and then press charges on someone's mama the next minute but it's whatever and she didn't even beat him up all she did really was spit on him but they arrested her and they took her to county jail too and she was in the pod next door so for those two weeks that I was waiting to go to prison I would go get my pills in the morning and I would look out and my mom would be taking her medication too and I'd wave at her I love my mom and she went to jail for me she heard someone talking shit about one of her kids and she was ready to throw down. That's what type of person she is. We all have character flaws, you know, me included. And we also have great strengths of character. And that woman is the most loyal person I know when it comes to sticking by people. My mom, you know, when I went to prison, everybody fell off. I didn't hear from my friends too often. There was one person who I knew in high school, really, who stayed in contact with me. And that was uh, a chick named Morgan, still a good friend of mine. Um, she would write me periodically. But like after my dad died, 
My sisters hardly wrote me. They hardly came up to see me. Um, everyone fell off, except for my mom. I got a letter from my mother at least once a week while I was in prison. That's what type of person she is. Anyway, after all that happened, I went to county jail. And I would be in county jail for two weeks, waiting to go to prison. I had to wait for them to, you know, get a bed for me. And for those two weeks, I can't say, I can't say that I was sad or angry or depressed or anything like that. Mostly, I was numb internally. But then, you know, I was, I was sentenced on January 14th. I think I went to prison on February 1st, right around there. One morning they called into my cell at 6.30 a.m. And they said, Swanson, pack your shit, you're going to DOC. So I got up, packed my stuff. It took me all of 10 minutes. And they brought me out to the booking area and they put me in a holding cell to wait for transport to come pick me up. Well, Jake, the guy who pressed charges on my mama, um, he was going to DOC on the same day. And I guess, you know, when, when they told me to pack my stuff, I didn't raise hell. I didn't, you know, I just said, all right. And I went and I packed my stuff and here we go. Let's go to prison. He was not the same way. When they told him to pack his stuff, he threw a little bitch fit, I guess, because he didn't want to pack his stuff. And so they didn't give him any of his property. They just threw him in a holding cell. They didn't even let him put his shoes on. And that is when things started setting in, you know, the reality of it. Here I'm going, I'm going to prison. And although I hadn't been feeling anything emotionally up until that point, Right about then, I started feeling some emotions. I started feeling nervous. I started feeling scared. I knew I was gonna be going to a very violent and hostile world for, you know, I was sentenced to 13 years. So, this was it. There was nothing I could do about it. I had accepted it, but damn. Damn, was it hard. So transport came and they got us and they actually handcuffed us together. Me and this dude who pressed charges on my mama. I'm going to keep saying that press charges on my mama. Can you hear me? He pressed charges on my mom. <laughs> Moving on. <clears throat> so, uh, they handcuffed us together and that was an awkward ride and we rode in this transport vehicle for probably two hours handcuffed to each other we didn't really say much to each other and you know what i like to have done is wrap the the handcuffs around his neck and headbutt him a couple times but you know i was beginning my journey of reformation and rehabilitation i was becoming a nice person sort of I'm still trying. Anyway, we get to the prison and there's this long road leading up to the prison and the prison's huge. You know, you have these great big fences, you have these huge concrete buildings and El Dorado is broken into two parts, the east side and the west side. On the west side, when you pull up, it's these, yeah, it's just a crazy thing to behold. But you have all these big concrete buildings on either side. West side is Supermax RDU, the whole, and Max custody at the time. On the east side, you had general population, low and high medium. And in the middle, you had the administration building and the gym and yard area. And you see the towers, you see the fences with the razor wire across the top. And in El Dorado, they actually had razor wire going up the sides. They had spools of it going up the sides of the fence so people couldn't cut through and work their, their way through the fence. And we pulled in the gate and the gates, there's, there's two gates. There's two gates and two fences. And those gates are between the two fences. You drive in one, they inspect the vehicle, get your paperwork in order. 
and then they bring you through the other gate and bring you up to A and D. And you know, they had us stand outside the vehicle facing the fence while they were inspecting it. I think we were out there 20, 30 minutes for real. And the co-defendant boy didn't have his shoes because he was throwing a bitch fit back at the jail. And I, it was February, it must have been cold, but I can't say I felt sorry for him because he might have pressed charges on my mom or something like that, you know, uh, just saying. We get to A&D and it's a freaking shit show, man. Like they treat it like a boot camp. You walk in the doors and you got this fat, overgrown cop yelling at you, you know, take your clothes off, put them in this bin, get in the shower and, you know, and then they give you some de-lousing shampoo and you wash up with and then they parade you naked in front of nurses so they can make sure you don't have any diseases and STDs. That's what they say, but it's really just to humiliate you and to dehumanize you. That's how they break you down. And then after that whole process, and that took a while, not because there was a bunch of paperwork to do, but the nurses wanted to look at me for a little bit longer. No, that part's not true. I made that up. It was the paperwork. After all that, they were going to send us to a cell house in RDU. RDU is a diagnostic unit in Kansas. And the diagnostic unit, basically what they do, anyone who comes into prison has to go through RDU. And the reason for that is they need to assess you and evaluate you to determine your security level and what programs you're going to need to be, you know, rehabilitated which is bullshit because their program suck. So we did that. Um, yeah, cell house. They were taking us to the cell houses. The west side is where RDU is and where Supermax, the hole and max security was at the time. So you have A through E cell houses and each cell house is broken into two parts like A1, A2, B1, B2, and so on. A and B cell houses were super max. And at that time, I believe one half of C was the whole and max and the other half of C may have been super max as well. I'm not sure because they moved it around a lot. Sometimes they would use it for seg. Sometimes they would use it for max. Sometimes they would use it for, you know, super max. It's whatever. But D and E cell houses were both RDU. And they moved me to E2 because I was a mental health inmate. And they felt like I needed to be assessed before I could be around other people. So I went to a single man cell and not immediately though, but that's where I was going. And I was going to be locked down for most of the time, which in RDU, you, you're locked down for most of the time anyway. But they brought me into this cell house. So I walk in, it's huge. The west side cell houses in El Dorado are pretty damn big and they're wide open. The ceiling's like 30, 35 feet up. There's cells along each wall. They're only two tiers high, but there's so fucking many of them. And you know, it was loud. It's loud in those cell houses. You hear guys screaming from door to door and all that bullshit. And it's just really loud. And it immediately hits you that the place is built for a purpose. It's designed simply. Everything is concrete, steel. There's nothing comfortable or welcoming or inviting about the place. And when you walk in and you hear the screaming and you hear just that, that chaos, and you just see this wide open space with all these people locked in cages, Man, the gravity of it hits you. It really hits you. And everybody started yelling at me, you know. It's like that scene from Shawshank Redemption. When you first get to prison, everybody's going to be hollering at you, trying to make you feel intimidated. And that's what they were doing to me. But I ignored them. Now, they didn't have a cell open for me yet in E2. So they sat me at a table and they gave me a sack lunch to eat. So I sat down and I started eating my lunches. Meanwhile, the cells on either side of me, everybody's hollering at me, trying to make me feel intimidated. I'm ignoring them. And finally, one dude who was talking the most shit 
hollered out and he said, hey man, what are you in here for? You look awfully young. And I said, I'm in here for aggravated kidnapping. I kidnapped and shot me a pedophile. And immediately the cell house erupted, that section of the cell house erupted with people cheering, hollering, clapping. You know, pedophiles aren't very well liked in prison. So if you go to prison for kidnapping and shooting one, people are gonna be pretty happy about that. And that was the case. So the dude who was talking all that shit said, you know, he said, I apologize, man. I was barking up the wrong tree. If I see in GP when we get out of here, you know, I'll, if I see you on the yard, I'll buy you an ice cream or something. I said, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Not that I would actually ever take him up on that because you don't trust people in prison. You know, people are trying to give you stuff. It's always for a reason. They're trying to get over on you or something. You know, everybody's working an angle. So it did make me feel a little bit better about my situation though. You know, the reaction that people had in that section of the cell house kind of made me feel like, you know, maybe this wasn't gonna be so bad. I finished my lunch and they led me to a cell down on the end uh, near the corner of the cell house and I stepped in they closed the door behind me they'd given me a bedroll you know I had a blanket two towels and a pair of boxers I think and my jumpsuit and that was what I had and uh, when that door shut behind me you know I really got in my head a lot here I was 17 years old and I felt like I probably wouldn't see my dad outside of prison again. My dad was fairly old when I was arrested. You know, my I was worried about my mother. I knew I wasn't going to see my sisters for a long time. I wasn't going to be around to watch my nephews grow up. I wasn't going to be able to visit with them anymore. You know, I wasn't going to be around my friends. They were going to be going off to college and doing stuff and I wasn't going to be able to see him anymore or talk to him. None of that. And it set in that this place was my home now for a really long time. I was going to be living in places like this and I could hear the hollering and the screaming and all the anger and the sorrow in people's voices. And it was just a cacophony of negativity outside my cell. And the gravity of it all hit me and I went through so many different emotions. It's like wave after wave of emotion just washed over me. I felt sad. I felt angry. I felt depressed. I felt this sense of why me, even though I knew I did what I did and I accepted my crime and I accepted my sentence and I didn't run when I was on bond. It doesn't mean it was easy. It doesn't mean it was easy to accept. They didn't give me my medication when I transferred to RDU because they had to do their own evaluations with their mental health team in order for that to happen. And so I was gonna have at least a couple weeks where I didn't have any medication at all. In other words, stopping some pretty heavy psychotropics, cold turkey. Yeah, that sucked. That night was my first experience with prison food. I was locked in my cell all day. I didn't have anything to read or anything to do. I just laid on top of my bunk and it was cold. I had one blanket, a jumpsuit and a little hoodie, a real thin hoodie. But those cell houses were really cold. It was February in Kansas. It gets cold out here. So I was laying on top of my bunk shivering because we couldn't get underneath our blankets after 730, I think in the morning. It was against the rules. When it was time for chow, I ate my food and well, I didn't eat my food actually. I tasted it. We had American goulash. I'll never forget the first time I had prison food. It was American goulash and the noodles were so overcooked that it was just like a block on the tray, like a block of noodles looked like something out of Minecraft. There was no seasoning in it, you know, in prison, they buy really low grade meat. So it doesn't have much flavor and has a really, really gritty texture. There's people in prison who have 
problems with high blood pressure. Therefore, most of the food is not going to have a lot of salt. Uh, seasonings are expensive in general, so a lot of the food isn't going to have seasonings in it. It is the cheapest of the cheap food that you can get, and then it's poorly prepared because they make mass quantities of it. And if the food's not up to standard, fuck it. People are going to eat it anyway. Where else are they going to eat? Applebee's? I don't think so. I took one bite of that American goulash and I immediately threw up. That's how that went down. Luckily, our trays were served in our cells because I would have threw up all over a table. And I didn't eat. I just set that tray on my desk and I laid back down a little while later, like 10 minutes later, they opened up the doors for us to bring our trays out. We would stack them up on a table out there and the janitor, or the porter as we call them in prison, would pick up the trays and put them on a cart to be taken back to the kitchen. And when I brought my tray out to put it on the table, there's a porter sitting out there named Chopper. And he said, hey man, you ain't gonna eat your food? I said, nah, bro. And he said, well, can I have it? I said, hey, if you wanna eat it, go for it. I'm not eating it. And he said, thanks, man. And he takes the tray, which was really just a courtesy because as a porter, he could have taken that tray anyway. When I, once I put it on the table and stacked it up, he could have eaten that. The porters get the leftover trays anyway. But he asked and I said he could have it. And, you know, he reached out and he said, my name's Chopper. And I said, my name's Eric. We shook hands. And we knew each other for a while after that. We bumped into each other again in other prisons. So Chopper was a good dude. I like Chopper. And I went back to my cell and I laid down, but I didn't sleep all night. I was cold. My heart was in a bad place. My mind was in turmoil. That was one of the lowest points in my life. It was my first day in prison. So the takeaway here, don't go to prison. I don't want anybody to ever have to experience what I experienced. You see these guys making YouTube videos where they talk about how they hung out with gangsters and mafiosos and all this other stuff. And how they were, you know, career criminals. And they talk about it like it's a cool thing. It's not cool. Not at all. Missing out on your family, not being there for them. If you think that's cool or what's up, then you, you go do that. Losing everything that you ever had in life. If that's what you're into, prison might be a good place for you. But, you know, that was a really horrible time in my life. For real. Learn from my experiences, and I hope y'all can do something good out there. You know, for real, that's why I make these videos. So that is the end of the episode. I appreciate you guys watching. Sorry if the video and audio isn't exactly where it should be. It's a new camera, I'm learning it. First DSLR, but be sure to tune in next time. I'm Eric, I'll see y'all later. Right, right,